ngayon naman, nandito tayo sa steel under construction part ng ating HKP so ayan guys yung uh, magandang photoshoot section so, under construction pa rin <laughs> at yeah, most of it is done and looking pretty good and very UP Baguio <laughs> but yeah Hindi ko mabat ko yung ginagawa. Pero... Uh, ang ganda lang mag-stroll dito pa minsan-minsan. Makakita ko ng orchid uh, somewhere. Kasi madaming epiphytes yung ating mga puno dyan. At madami din lichens na sa paligid. So, yeah. Vloggers na si Sir nyo. And... Uh, bago tayo magsimula, uh, ayan po yung ating... University, uh, University of Calderiera, at in Baguio in general. So for this lecture, we'll have a very short and brief introduction on your Pylum glocopyta. Again, you have already encountered the Pylum glocopyta or the glocopites in our reading of Patrick Keeling on the origin of your plastids. Again, the glocopites are a very interesting group of a very small group of microscopic algae that is usually found in freshwater environment. There are, I think, at least about um, 13 species of glocopites that are described up to this day. And although they are not particularly common in nature, they are very important because they occupy a pivotal position in the evolution of photosynthesis, not just in the microbes, but also in the higher plants that we see of today, mostly in eukaryotic uh, photosynthetic organisms. They also represent a very and a key intermediate uh, position in the transition from endosymbion, your endosymbion plastid, in that they are unique in all those organisms that has this plastid in in the sense that they still retain the prokaryotic peptidoglycan layer between their two um, inner and outer membrane of their plastids so yeah the glocopite plastid is a still for me you know, the way i see it the glocopite plastid is um the transition point from your uh, the, the precursor cyanobacterial um, origin of plastid so that was eaten by your heterotropic eukaryotic organism so this glocopite this pylum occupy that intermediate transition point between between your origin your cyanobacterial um, ancestor that was eaten and your fully pledged plastids in your not just in your algae that we see but also in your land plants okay well that's how scientists see it so let's move point mm -mm. okay so first we'll have an outline of our discussion for today there are just two main points that we need to discuss. First is that interesting point of evolution of your chloroplast that um, your glucopites have shown that they are those transition, transition organism to, towards the evolution of photosynthesis and chloroplast in your eukaryotes and in your land plants too. And also, we'll, dis we'll dive in to the representative organism of the pylum glocopyta. So first, we'll discuss, oh, 
will discuss this move. Um, yeah, the evolution of chloroplast. So remember from our um, previous lecture on the evolution of your plastids, on the evolution of your chloroplast, we have your cyanobacterium or your what we call the cyanel, right? The, the cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacterium is the one that is being eaten. Remember? So this is oh this is the cyan sayonara. So let's just um delete ito na naman tayo cyanel. Okay? So it's the cyanel. So oh because it's the precursor organelle. It's the soon-to-be organelle, the soon-to-be plastid. So it's it's the uh, one that's being eaten, your cyanobacteria. And we have your, this one, this is the heterotropic eukaryotic organism that is about to eat that cyanobacteria, that cyanel. So, um, but what happened? The cyanel didn't get to be dissolve or didn't get to be disintegrated or it was not digested by your heterotropic um, eukaryote right here that has a nucleus so instead it forms a food vacuole and many um many integration with that um, organism so it forms that food vacuole right there and what happens is eventually different walls are lost in the process so different walls the pagosomal membrane is lost uh, the peptidoglycan layer is lost for some and eventually the last portion of that um, evolution of your chloroplast is that the nucleoid or i mean the the nucleoplasm, no? the, the area where there is this um, the genetic material, circular genetic material of your cyanobacteria gets to be relocated to your nucleus. So there are a lot of this genetic material that is transferred from the plastid or from the cyanel, the one that's being eaten, to the cyanome the host so let's just um oh making oh so a lot of these genes need to be transported to the uh, to the nucleus of the host organism the cyanome cyanome because in the integration process, that needs to happen. Okay? There's a need for that relocation of genes. Okay? Now, in, in most cases, in most cases of your primary endosymbiosis, in most cases of your primary endosymb primary plastids, that cell wall, that peptidoglycan cell wall, gets to be lost. But in the case of your, that's for the, that's the case of your green algae and red algae, those primary plastid, um, those primary endosymbiosis um, organism. But for the case of your glucopite, which is also a primary, uh, which is also a product of your primary endosymbiosis, this uh, cell wall has not been lost. This peptidoglycan cell wall has not been lost. Now. The reason for that is still unclear up to this day, whether it is because uh, the endosymbiotic event happened in, the, in a later portion of the, well, in the geolo geological time scale, you know, in the evolutionary time scale, it happened way before or way later, or that it just didn't um, occur that that wall uh, got lost along the way. But Science, scientists think that the loss of that cell wall 
material of that cyanobacteria is important because if you lose that cyanobacterial cell wall, there would be a faster exchange of material from your um, cytoplasm and to that cyanel, that organelle, right? If you don't have that um, cell wall, it would be easier to target the protein products of your ribosomes outside or in, in the products of your um, plastid towards the cytoplasm. So there would be much faster and you don't need to develop all these genes to target these peptide proteins to cross that peptidoglycan cell wall. But up to this day, scientists are still not sure if it's if for the reason and scientists are still not sure uh, what is the real reason why this um this cell wall still exists in your glucopines but they postulize you know, they theorize that the cell wall is still present in your glucopines because they are still in that intermediate or still in that transition zone of becoming or losing, you know, eventually losing that cell wall. There's still a representative organism that is in the process of losing that cell wall material. So in the evolution of your chloroplast, there are different scientists that um, um, actually um, put forward different uh, publications back then regarding regarding the evolution of chloroplast say for example konstantin merschowski published the nature and origin of chromatophores in the plant kingdom in 1905 wherein he talks about lichens and he calls this green photosynthetic organism that lives inside this lichen or yeah that lives inside this uh, like an as the little green slaves no because back then <laughs> because back then cultural sensitivity was not the norm that's why he call it the little green slaves yeah <laughs> but anyway so yeah before that was the, the the term that we use for this plastid or this um um this um enslaved cyanobacterium inside the organism right <laughs> so that's your little green slave that provides all the food photosynthesize and uh well it's not really a slave because it's mutualistic in nature but yeah you decide you guys decide uh and after uh konstantin merchowski we also have pasture in 1914 where he coined the cyanel and cyanome that we use today where we're in your cyanel is the soon-to-be organelle, the organelle, the cyanome is the host. So yeah. And he also coined the term syn cyanosis, which uh, essentially mean shared relationship. So syn, shared relationship, cyanosis. So yeah, that's your pasture. Aside from then, the, I think the most um, widely accepted and widely popular a theory on the evolution of chloroplasts is by Lynn Margulis, which is, well, the endosymbiotic theory. So the endosymbiotic theory by Lynn Margulis, you all know the, the, the story of, of the endosymbiotic theory, wherein uh, Lynn Margulis thought that since your, um, your chloroplast in plants and in this algae can undergo their own reproduction they have their own genetic machinery inside them they have their own dna inside them and uh, there are a lot of other supporting um, evidences like say for example they're about your chloroplasts are about the same size as your cyanobacteria they evolve oxygen in uh, photosynthesis and they uh, they use oxygen in photosynthesis uh, sorry they produce oxygen in photosynthesis they also have circular dna without uh, any basic proteins like your histones for coiling remember your histones for uh, packing up your dna into these neatly shaped meta metamere chromosomes yeah um your 
chloroplast and your cyanobacteria doesn't have that and they also both have chlorophyll A. And with these supporting evidences and given the fact that these um, chloroplasts have their own DNA, they can do their own reproduction independent of the, well, to a certain sense, to independent of the uh, host, of the eukaryotic host, he theorized that maybe the cyanobacteria was eaten and was not digested and eventually became integrated inside the eukaryotic heterotrope that ate him, the her, it, I mean. <laughs> so that's the theory of endosymbiosis again, reiterating again and again because it's fairly important for this course. Now moving on with your uh, pylum glocopyta, we'll talk about its evolutionary history, its general characteristics, and its uh, representatives. So let's uh, look at the different um, pylum under your glocopites. So uh, let's just go back to uh, this figure of killing right here. If you remember this figure, I love this figure because it's very colorful. And where are your glocopites right here? It's right here uh, clustered within your plantae clade. So that's why I don't uh, blame other people for, for saying algae is a plant or algae are plant because um, technically uh, most of the representative in your algae are inside the plantae kingdom. So yeah, don't, don't blame them for using plant, algae, plant interchangeably. I mean, you know, we smirk at them and laugh at them sometimes. <laughs> I mean, in the locker room, for example, or maybe at our, when we are at home and yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we don't we don't do that, no. That's called I don't know what that's called. But anyway, so that's your glucopite in a close relationship with your red, uh, your chloropites, your green, and your charopites and your land plants, right there. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so your pylum glucopite uh, from Scuja in 1954. He calls the pylum, the glucopite representatives, as an intermediate in the evolution of your chloroplast. Why did he call that? Because uh, usually we have a cyanel that has two membrane, right? We have a plastid that has a two membrane, but when you look at the glucopite, you still have that cell wall material, the peptidoglycan cell wall. Aside from that, he also seen other pigment that are present in your glucopites and in your cyanobacteria too. You have chlorophyll A and your picobiliproteins. However, your uh, glucopite lacks certain cyanobacterial carotenoids like your mixosantopil and your echinion. Okay? In terms of representatives, well, <coughs> uh, first, uh, we need to have that um, idea that the primary endosymbiosis where your heterotrophic eukaryote eats a gram-negative cyanobacterium, which is retained rather than being digested, the, cyan the cyanobacterial endosymbiont is substantially reduced and a large amount and a large number of genes in that cyanobacterium cyanel is transferred to the nuclear genome of the host, right? It's transferred. But the, the case of your glucopite, that's not completely uh, true. No? There's, there's still some DNA that is left in your cyanel, in your cyanobacteria endosymbiont. There's still uh, certain genes that is left in that cyanobacteria endosymbiont. Uh, say, for example, right, later on we'll talk about it. But what I want you to, to remember is that the primary plastid here is bounded in normal. No, normally, the cyanobacter, the primary plastid, diba? normally, it only has, is bounded by two membrane. 
which is derived from the inner and the outer membrane of your cyanobacterium. Because, again, the inner and the outer cyan uh, cyanobacterial membrane is very important in photosynthesis of the cyanobacterium. The presumed pagosomal membrane, the peptidoglycan cell wall, diba? kasi apat yung maximum possible of membrane that you can have, the pagosomal membrane, the peptidoglycan cell wall is lost. But for the case of glucopites, the peptidoglycan cell wall uh, still remains. Right? So aside from that, in the representatives of your glucopites, say for example, in cyanopora paradoxa, it also has a two cyanel, two plastid. No? It has two flagella. It has a primitive rubisco. Now, um, look at this drawing right here. It's a very good drawing. <laughs> So, this is your cyanophora paradoxa. Mag-drawing ulit ako ng iba. So, ito yung plastid niya. Isang plastid lang yung do-drawing ko. Yeah. Now, in terms of rubisco, no? si rubisco na masarap ang feeling, in terms, ito yung nucleus niya. Yan yung nucleus, ito yung plastid. Sige, lakihan natin yung nucleus para alam nyo siya yung nucleus. So, may nucleus ka sa eukaryotic organism to, and you have your plastids right there. Now, sorry, See, normally, in normal plants, in normal, uh, sorry, in normal photosynthetic organism, no? normal photosynthetic organism, you have rubisco. So, si rubisco, I usually, uh, ayan, 16, yung kanyang subunits, ay, ang galing ng drawing, sub, oh, so, meron kang 16 subunits nung uh, protein na to, nung enzyme na to. So, sabihin natin, 8, 8 na large at 8 na small subunit. Yung 8 na large na yan, galing kay, oh, manggagaling yan kay, kay nucleus. So, 8 large subunit would be produced by your nucleus. The other 8 um, small subunit would come or would be uh, dictated by the genetic material in your chloroplast. And then they will join together and they will, let's vault in and we'll create the bolt spike. <laughs> no, yeah. So, yeah. In a normal photosynthetic organism, that 16 subunit uh, rubisco, the 18, the 8 large subunit comes from the nucleus of the organism. The other eight small subunit no, would come from the chloroplast and then it will join together. So, uh, essentially, there is this part or sharing in control in the production of rubisco. But, in the case of your cyanopora paradoxa, it has this what we call primitive rubisco, in which all of that subunit of your rubisco comes from solely it is solely coded by your chloroplast. Again, hinting that this organism is still not, is still not finished in the transition process. That's why they are still considered as an intermediate in the evolution of your chloroplast. They are those, uh, kung, kung tatawagin natin siya in terms ng mga tao, yung missing link. No? Missing link kung tawagin. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of mechanism of uh, division of your chloroplast, uh, usually maganda yung pag-divide ng chloroplast natin. Diba, meron kang dynamic ring, kinoconstrict yung different rings, yung inner membrane and outer membrane of your, um, of your plastids. But for the case of your cyanopora paradoxa, there is this um, um, certain uh, joining of your uh, plastic during the cleavage process. Maybe it's due to the uh, to the uh, still present uh, peptidoglycan cell wall. So it's not um, from what I think about it. When I think about it, it's not completely cleave. Although there is a cleavage process right there. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, other representatives of your glucopite, and this is our last slide for today, is your glucocystis. This is a group with uh, two cyanols right here and right here. 
and a centrally located um, nucleus. And yeah, that's your glucocystis. Your glucocystis and the different representative of your glucopites, uh, very, they, they represent a very important part. And if you look at the different publication regarding uh, plastid genome evolution, the photosynthesis and the evolution of life, um, you would never go wrong and you can always see these uh, organism. For example, the glucocystis will always pop up in uh, those articles. So you might have encountered them when you research on the origin or the evolution of uh, plastid. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of exciting um, facets to these um, organisms since they represent a transitional um, group to the evolutionary tree. And if you want to sequence their genome and do a metagenomic analysis or certain uh, bioinformatics um, on them, that would uh, greatly help in uh, elucidating the evolution of plastid in the tree of life. So yeah, uh, in terms of their diversity, they, the glucopites might not be the most um, diverse of them all. There are very few representatives of this uh, freshwater organism. Um, but yeah, they are very important in the sense that uh, these organisms serves as what I call a missing link in the evolution of your chloroplast. Although they, not, uh, they don't matter that much in the grander sense of the word, they are the missing link that completes the story, the evolution, photosynthesis, and chloroplast, not just in eukaryotes, but also in the higher plants. That's it's all for our lecture for today. Thank you all for watching. This is Sir Patrick. Peace out.